They got the, this beet garden looks kind of sad and forlorn, but believe me, there's beets in there. And uh, I think today I'm actually going to pick some and pickle them. I mean, let me pull one. That's a nice beet. <laughs> Baseball. That looks like a, a hardball. Hey, it's Greg here with MaritimeGardening.com and it's time to do another garden tour. It's been a week since Hurricane Dorian hit Nova Scotia and my garden was hit pretty well. I did a, a very brief uh, video after the hurricane, but uh, I promised a, uh, I, do, I do a garden tour like the seventh, I don't know why I've chosen that date, but anyway, about a week into every single month, once a month I do a garden tour video and it's time to do that. And this garden tour, like every other one, is brought to you by my sponsor, Vessi Seeds. About 95% of the uh, things growing in my garden are the result of seeds that were provided to me by Vessi Seeds. They sponsor the uh, YouTube channel and the podcast and uh, everything that's made possible is uh, here is made possible by them financially. Uh, if you need something for your garden and they sell it, buy it from them and that'll help so support uh, this channel and the podcast. There's a, if you check the description box of this video, there's a coupon code that you can use to buy uh, whatever it is you might need from them. I think they this time of year is time to buy garlic and bulbs like tulips and stuff like that. But anyway, I'll leave that up to you. So uh, with no further ado, let's get going with the garden tour. All right, it's a bit windy, but uh, I've got some something set up here to deal with the wind to some extent. Hopefully it's not too bad. Uh, this is the only day I've got to film this, so I got to just work with the conditions. Here we are at the entrance of the garden. And uh, this bed had potatoes in it. They're all dug and I just put some uh, you know, grass clippings here and it's basically done for the year. I got potatoes in this garden that need to be harvested. You can't tell, but there's potatoes in there. <laughs> if, I, if I reached in and dug around with my hands, I'm sure I could find one. Uh, these are the uh, squash that I had growing in this bed, which probably looked really nice in the last video. And now they kind of look all hellish. I mean, you can see I got some, some good sized squash. That one there I'm pointing to with my finger is about 16 inches end to end. So it's a good sized squash. And I got a number of those. They're good eating and uh, you can make jack-o'-lanterns out of them. Uh, I really haven't done any updates on the people that saw me build those beds up there for pumpkins. They performed really poorly this year. And I just don't think they got the kind of moisture they needed. I didn't do anything. So I mean up there, you're looking at a garden where I stuck three pumpkin seeds in the ground. And uh, at some point in the summer, I. Uh, plucked out two of them and left one to grow and but didn't do anything. I haven't watered. I haven't done nothing up there So uh, I think the poor results not for lack of Sun and they had good soil So the other thing is moisture. I just don't think they had the moisture they need so I have to do a little redesign up there um, I got little you know, you can see a pumpkin up there, but uh, not the greatest results uh, down here uh, I've got the uh, kale growing here and um, and uh, I let my lawn, I didn't really mow my lawn for the month of August. So when I did mow it, I had to, you know, rake up some of the grass. There's just too much to use the mulching blade. So uh, um, I put some of the grass clippings down on this bed. And it's been uh, doing wonders for this kale. I don't know if you can tell the difference, but the, there's nothing like putting grass clippings down on kale. I honestly think for my, um, you know, at the end of every season, I make little notes for things to do next year. And one thing I'm going to make a note to do is that around the end of July to put grass clippings on my kale beds because it just seems to give them this massive uh, nitrogen boost and you know, that would be around the end of July and that's when you're it's at the driest so you need something to retain the moisture anyway and grass clippings seem to be the thing, the bee's knees when it comes to uh, healthy kale. Uh, anyway, I got some beans and uh, the corn didn't amount too much. This bed I mean, different beds have different uh, properties, and you you, mean, you can you can amend the bed and you can work with a bed, or you can just identify a bed as, as not being very good for growing certain things. And uh, the kale, I'll show you some other kale in a couple seconds, but the kale in this garden grew okay, but it didn't grow great. This is a good garden for growing beans. It's a great garden for growing any sort of root vegetables like carrots or potatoes. Um, kale, I didn't. I mean, I got kale, and I got results, but. Uh, Definitely not the best. Look at that guy. There's a little caterpillar on my kale. Right there. Hopefully something comes along. There was a dragonfly here just a couple seconds ago. Uh, yeah. 
anyway he's not doing any good <laughs> that's for sure uh, anyway let me show you uh, so these are like a raised bed sort of thing so these beds would be about 16 inches above grade so you, you get a bit of uh, drainage issues there it's good for drainage but of course you uh, don't get the moisture I grew carrots here last year and they did really really well because they, they have that long deep tap root and they could get down to the water but look over here same variety of kale planted around the same time and so much bigger and so much greener right these are at grade nice and green the whole thing's green they don't have that sort of washed out look and then look over here kale at grade that this, this was a um, garlic garden but uh, when the garlic finished off I moved some kale in here that was a bit crowded look at the size of these ones right mulched with grass so uh, yeah <laughs> kale at grade mulched with grass uh, that seems to be the you know I mean it really depends on you know you don't have to follow that as a, as a rule of thumb but the results I think speak for themselves um, looking really good just the biggest healthiest greenest looking kale I have of the same variety at grade mulch with grass that seems to be the way to go look at this uh, uh, collard green just huge and thick right also everything in this garden you know there's extremely well spaced so uh, it's you know you, one is inclined to plant things like really close together especially when they're tiny and small that you but uh, as they get bigger uh, plants need space if they get the space they, they will grow grow big these are all also I guess I should follow up during the hurricane these were the kale that were tipped over right and I just propped them back up you can see uh, like this one here I just I, I lean I bent it back up and I put a I don't know if you can see there's a rock, a rock there. So it's just sort of leaning against the rock. I just bent it back and, and jammed a rock in there to hold it in place. That's all I did. Because these were leaned right over after the hurricane. Uh, this trellis, for that matter, was bent up pretty good. And I mean, I should just pull it out. I just need a good afternoon to to, uh, to get to things here I, I really haven't done a thing since the hurricane other, other than I spent about an hour here after the hurricane to put the garden backs to rights so and all I did was a grab a rock and just pound the post down a little bit <laughs> and sure short back up but the beans on this trellis are done anyway so it should just come out of there uh, the bottom of this garden is all potatoes and they need to be dug so that's stuff I'm going to be doing this week I think I mean let me go back to the beginning of the garden because uh I'm getting a little bit uh, off on tangents. All right, so you saw the kale over here. Now let's look to the right of the garden. Um, these uh, Swiss chard are still going on strong. I haven't picked them for a couple weeks now, so I got to get in here and, you know, when they, see, see how they look? Some of them, some of the leaves don't look so good. All you really got to do is get in there and snap off those leaves and, uh, you know, just, just harvest them regularly. Uh, today I'm going to do some preserving of greens, just blanching and putting them in little, uh, as I've shown in videos, freezing them in little cakes, one pound cakes. Um, so I'm going to do some of that. So uh, it wouldn't take long to go through this bed and just remove all the, you know, the leaves that have this, this sort of color, right? And then all of a sudden everything's green again. I mean, the plant's not doing anything with these. These are just sort of robbing the plant. So anyway, these, these, these have been growing since April and they will continue to grow and produce right up until uh, October, November, as long as it doesn't get... Uh, you know consistent to below zero you know, any day where you can have a night where it goes below zero and, and these just sort of freeze solid and then if it gets warm again during the day and the soil thaws out these just thaw out and go right back to growing so I mean there's a certain temperature where they just stop growing <laughs> of course right but uh, I found right up until November you, you can harvest Swiss chard same with kale uh, here's the zucchini they're still growing they're still alive they're all sort of smashed and laid down but I still have some. I think I got one over. There's one. There's one in there. Right. Nice one. I got a nice uh, yellow one here. I love making relish with these yellow ones, that golden relish. Um, so yeah, we still got some zucchini coming out of here. The cukes are done. <laughs> and I've I've paid so many pickles this summer. I'm I'm done dealing with. I've had enough. There's still some growing in there. These giant, weird-looking ones. Uh, that we can use for salads and stuff but i'm sort of done with dealing with the cucumbers and the trellis looks like it's done with being a trellis 
<laughs> that hurricane really uh, took it to the trellis good. But, I mean, it, it, it worked, you know. Um, these beans, these are bush beans that I planted. Oh, geez, that might have been 1st of July, very late in the season. Um, they are still producing, right? Here's some right here. Even though it looks like someone jumped on this bed, that was the effect of the hurricane. Uh, but they're still producing, but that's pretty much the last of my beans for this year. A late planting, still producing. I got some, some of those onions I planted from seeds are doing all right, but they're not my biggest onion. My best onions this year were planted from sets. I've had other years where the seeds do well. Uh, all my direct seeded onions were planted in this bed here, which isn't the best real estate in my garden because it gets sort of shade. It's a good garden for things uh, like lettuce and stuff like that if you want to, you know, slow them down a bit. So, uh, lesson learned for next year. This will be a lettuce garden, I think. Uh, people ask me all the time about uh, when to plant a fall crop of lettuce and stuff like that. So, so this bed here, the lettuce growing in this bed, would have been sowed around the middle of August. And uh, there's some cilantro there and uh, lettuce here. I think this is uh, spinach here, right? And there's lettuce over there. You know, it's growing, but this again, this this bed is not prime real estate in terms of sunniness. Um, so we'll see what happens. But uh, you know, really, where I live anyway, if you want to get a decent fall crop of greens, uh, <laughs> really early August is when to get those seeds in the ground <laughs> if you're direct seeding. Uh, you know, people have talked about me you know, starting to sow stuff now. And you really sort of missed it. I mean, just uh, Friday night, two nights ago, we had a risk of frost here. It got down to five Celsius that night. I, I was actually out outdoors sleeping at my camp, and it was a pretty cold night. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we didn't get frost here. At least I don't think we did. But there was a risk of frost that night. So we're already, we're halfway through September. We're into a risk of frost. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're just not going to get, uh, maybe if you're really clever with a cold frame or something like that, maybe you can make something happen, depending on how sunny it is where you are. I know I direct seeded spinach, one of the fastest growing greens you can plant, first of October last year in a cold frame. It, it didn't amount to anything. It was by the time the world started freezing, you know, late November, early December, the spinach were only a couple inches high and they really didn't grow until, they just went dormant until March. So uh, anyway, you can do it. You just got to be, be very proactive and, and get, uh, you know, sow everything in, I would say, early August for where I am, and this is zone 6A, but it's, uh, you know, that doesn't really mean much. It's a question of how much sun and how overcast it is and temperatures and things like that. Um, your zone just speaks to how cold it gets in the winter. I said, said this many times, but every time I don't back that statement up with uh, that qualifier, I get all these uh, ridiculous comments. <laughs> so anyway, um, I got uh, this beet garden looks kind of sad and forlorn but believe me there's beets in there and uh, I think today I'm actually going to pick some and pickle them. I mean let me pull one. That's a nice beet. <laughs> right? Baseball. It looks like a hardball if you ever played baseball as a kid. It's the same size as a hardball. It's a good size beet. Um, so I got a you know a good number of beets like this and uh, it's time to do some pickled beets. Man I love beets. Eggplant. Direct seeded eggplant. Look at that. Eggplant. Eggplant. People normally yet use those as transplants. I direct seeded these. Now, I mean, I haven't broken any records here. This was just a, a bit of an experiment. Will it work, right? And yeah, that's, a, that's not a bad looking eggplant. I think with a little bit of refining, I can probably get a good yield if I find a really fast growing variety. And maybe I plant them about a week or two earlier than I did this year. And uh, maybe the uh, the season just cooperates. Maybe we have a little bit more sunny uh, <laughs> sort of early season. And this year we really didn't get any sun until June, and then it was just I'm oh, sorry, we didn't get any sun until July. <laughs> and then from July onwards it was crazy sunny. Uh, but uh, May and June were useless this year. A good June or even a good May June would uh, make a huge difference using this uh, direct seating under the dome technique that I. I like to use. Uh, these uh, parsnips look uh, kind of uh, wrecked, but uh, that's just what they typically look like this time of year. 
and uh, I mean some of these are just huge I got a really good yield of parsnips this year I can't wait to do a video where I dig these things up and do the big old reveal uh, salsify my first attempt at salsify uh, these things here that look like grass are the salsify and uh, uh, I'm not going to pull into today but uh, it's, it's like a carrot parsnip like plant I have no idea what they taste like I don't think they taste anything like carrots or parsnips but they store well and they're sort of a, a classic uh, crop for this growing this kind of growing zone uh, you know very pragmatic root vegetable if they taste good at all I'll stick with them and, and plant them every year they were certainly easy to grow I mean I just stuck a seed in the ground and they grew so if they taste good and they keep well I'm gonna stick with them uh, in this garden here I tried to be cute and I tried to use, uh, it's a good point, six inch spacing. So basically I planted something every six inches, uh, beets and salsify. And what happened was that the salsify grew really well. And the beets just, you know, like, like these ones aren't bad. I got some decent size out of these beets here. But a lot of the other beets just didn't amount to much. And I think it's just from over competing for light and stuff from the salsify. So really I, you know, I think uh, maybe 10 to 12 inches, 30 centimeters is uh, just a more functional spacing. I mean, that's the sort of thing the seeds packages tend to say anyway, right? But, uh, you know, we, uh, we gardeners tend to be an independent bunch and we tend to just do whatever we think we should do. Uh, it's always good to do experiments. Lots of carrots in the carrot garden. I don't really deal with carrots until, uh, oh, like October, because a good frost seems to really improve the flavor. Uh, my cucumber garden is just about done. Incredible amount of vetch growing in here, but, uh, I, mean, I still get a lot of cucumbers out of it, and uh, as far as I understand it, vetch is nitrogen fixing anyway, so as long as I can get some newspaper down and just smother out um, the, the vetch before it goes to seed too bad, I think it'll be fine. These plants are pretty much done producing anyway, so I think uh, it's definitely worth taking the trellis down and just loading up some leaves or something on top of it and shutting it down for the year. My uh, grapes got a pretty good, pretty good crop of grapes this year, and they're still not ready. I mean, ugh. yeah, a little bit bitter. They're still not ready, and uh, getting close to <laughs> getting close to uh, frost season. So I don't know what's gonna happen with these grapes, but uh, they're definitely not ready to be harvested. And uh, I lost so much foliage from the hurricane. They're pretty exposed, so I'm pretty sure the local birds all know that there's grapes here now. And they're just waiting for... The birds seem to always know when the grapes are ready. So I'm not very optimistic that I'll get I'll get to eat any of these. <laughs> I'll come home one day and they'll all be gone. That's what I expect. But anyway, looks pretty good for now. That's my first... So I planted these maybe four or five years ago, and this is the first year they really, you know, come in with these nice clusters. And uh, I, I have no idea. I didn't know anything about grapes when I bought these, and I'm really not much of a, an aficionado. I think this was a variety for wine, and I don't have enough here for wine. I'm really not set up in my house to, um, to make wine and stuff like that. So I'll have to see what they taste like. In the uh, post-hurricane video, uh, I said I'd show how I brought my trees back up. So, you know, I just got some old rags and put them around the base of the tree. And then using, you know, strings, and you can't see, but there's a stake in the ground here using the, uh, what's it called, the uh, trucker's hitch, for the most part. I got a video on knots, if you want to run that. Very useful knot. It's a good thing for winching things down. Anyway, I just used, uh, this one here, I just used one string to pull it back up and get it somewhat straight. Uh, this one, other one over here, I think I used two, got two guy lines, but... Yeah, there's one going out over there. Two different, actually three different directions. And I really, I really wish I'd, you know, tied these trees down before the hurricane because they, they went over pretty hard. So I'll leave this line on for maybe a month. Then I'll take it off and see uh, if the tree can stand up on its own without them. I prefer to leave it, you know, let the, let the trunk breathe and stuff like that. I don't want to have those rags on there indefinitely. We'll just see what happens. Well, that's all I did. I just used ropes to, and stakes to bring it back. And uh, the reason you use the rags on the trunk, of course, is so your rope doesn't cut into the bark 
and damage the tree. The, uh, the sand pathway, one liability is that this sort of, this, the, the rain, I think during that uh, hurricane, we got some crazy amount of rain, like, uh, I can't remember what it was, 50 millimeters in two hours or something like that. Pretty intense rain. So it created this sort of canyon <laughs> down the garden. But, and uh, now there's this big pile of sand that was deposited at the base here, almost like a river delta. So uh, kind of cool to show the kids. And I don't know how much they took away from that. I was trying to give a lecture on sedimentation and rivers and canyons and such. I, I don't know if it really uh, struck home, but... <laughs> I found it fascinating. So uh, anyway, I got to um, what what one viewer suggested. And I think it's the way to do it is to create, you know, to put a, a log across here, sort of thing, and make little, almost like steps going all the way up. Maybe every six feet, make a little step, and that way the water can't gain velocity as it goes down. So that's another fall project. Hopefully, I can get around to that. Uh, I intend to bring a bit more sand in here, either this fall or next spring. Um, I think this amount of sand was not quite enough. So, uh, anyway, that's the interior. I think that's a good viewing of the interior. Um, oh, the peppers. Yes, the peppers. Talk about the peppers. So, uh, these are the peppers I direct seeded in a cold frame. And I thought I'd just do a follow up here. So, as far as I know, this tall one, which is the biggest one, was direct seeded. And this tall one was direct seeded. Everything else was um, transplanted. So it doesn't look like much going to happen. I mean, so this transplanted one seems to have gotten some peppers on it. And this so has this one. All kind of pathetic. Not, not really impressive looking peppers. And again, I didn't really put much time or energy into these. I just stuck a seed in the ground and let nature take its course. Maybe with a little bit more TLC. And time, love, and tenderness, uh, perhaps i got to get better peppers here. Um, i got some ideas for next year. One of these years, I'm going to direct seed a pepper, and I'm going to get great results. <laughs> I know there's someone screaming at the television saying, just get a grow light and, and do transplants, man. <laughs> but, I mean, this was, grown, this, this was a transplant that I bought. This was fully grown when I put it in the ground. So I put this thing in the ground fully grown, and this thing was maybe an inch high. And look at the size of this one now. All right, so this was a transplant, and it still didn't do that well. Just to get, give you a sense of just, this, you know, it's, it's challenging to grow peppers where I am. This is a transplant that I bought at a garden center. And I stuck it in the soil, and the soil was good and warmed up. And uh, still didn't get much out of it. One little pathetic pepper out of this guy. This one actually, I don't know what variety this is, maybe that Gong Bao or something like that, but it looks like I've got some decent... Uh, Peppers here, I don't know if these are supposed to be sweet or spicy or, or what. Let me just take a little bite here. Whoa! Hot! Oh my goodness. Yeah, they're hot. <laughs> That's a hot pepper, man. I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue this video. <laughs> we'll see what, uh, see what happens. <laughs> anyway, those are hot. So, I mean, those, that, those two did work. But I mean, this, as far as I know, over here, the same variety as those ones that grew peppers, and none of them planted at the same time. None of these got peppers. So I don't understand that at all. I had some nice, big, beautiful uh, direct seeded basil here, which I've, I've, I harvested it all and made pesto out of that. Uh, that worked out well. And of course, these tomatoes, I mean, I moved a lot of them out of here. But uh, this is producing, this sort of got smashed down from the hurricane. But that's okay, they're still growing. They're doing fine. Out here outside the garden enclosure, um, that was a potato garden. I've picked all, the, I picked all the potatoes out of that one yesterday, Red New Orleans. Put some grass clippings on it and it's basically done for the year. This one is still dying back, so I'm going to leave it a little bit longer. But the potatoes need to be harvested out of here. Foilage in the squash is all but removed. I like guess a nice looking, uh, what's it called, Watered, Warded, Warded Hubbard, I think is the name of it. Because it looks kind of, they bring in a little closer to this one. Well, it's got this sort of warty texture. It's supposed to be good tasting, good storage uh, uh, squash. I've got a pretty big hand. I think a eight or nine inch wingspan on my hand, or hand span. 
give you, just to give you a sense of the size of this thing. It's the size of a basketball. That's the biggest one. I wish they were all this big, but you know, maybe next year I give it a little bit better real estate. We'll see what happens. For me, it's all about the flavor. If I like the flavor of these, I'll grow them every year. I'm looking for a really good tasting squash that keeps really well. That's what I'm looking for. A um, little experiment I did this year. This area, this weedy looking area, I had a bunch of my own seed potatoes. They were, you know, just different sizes and not that impressive. Um, I, I just threw them all on the ground here and covered this whole thing with leaves. So underneath these leaves, there is potatoes. Huh, there's one right there. Right. So uh, I think I'm going to do a video where I dig these up and do a little bit because they're all dead. Potatoes are, you, can't even, you can't even see the potato plants here. Right. But it did a great job at, at suppressing the weeds here. And I think it would be a great sort of reveal because these were a pure year one Ruth Stout Garden type potato attempt. No soil, no manure, no nothing. Just just grass, potatoes on the grass, and leaves on the potatoes, and nothing else. Didn't do nothing. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to guess that a lot... I mean, we'll see. I'll do a video on this. I'm going to guess there's a lot of little ones like this, right? Because they didn't get ideal location. Kind of shady here. Right? That way south, and there's a bit of a wall here. So they didn't have, you know, prime real estate. And I did, they didn't have ideal, you know, sort of soil or anything like that. But just for keeping weeds in check... Yeah, you know, you just, you just throw some leaves down and you get potatoes as a result. I'm cool with that. So we'll see what we get. This garden here had garlic in it. I moved one of my t tomato plants from the tomato garden. Look at the size of some of these babies. That's a big old tomato, man. Oh, came off almost the size of a softball. Not a hardball. <laughs> nice one. So, uh, yeah, got lots of tomatoes. I'm picking a bowl of tomatoes every couple of days now. Uh, this was a garlic garden that's just gone totally crazy with different things. I I stuck one squash seed in the corner of the garden. I got that squash and that squash for my efforts. That's not a bad return. Might be another one in the grass over there too somewhere. The uh, tomato garden is producing. This isn't uh, you know any anything to write home or brag about, but I'm I'm getting you know <laughs> I'm filling a bowl of tomatoes every couple of days. And I got lots of these little plum ones. I'm going to pickle some of these. Right? So, I mean, I planted tomatoes and I got tomatoes. So, <laughs> I'm cool with that. And I didn't really do much. I haven't watered this or done anything. Now, this garden here is potatoes. They just need to be picked. Looks like a weed patch, but it's full of potatoes. And uh, I'm not sure if I feel around just about anywhere. Of course, the garden will make a liar of me. Anyway, there's potatoes in there. It just needs to... <laughs> At least there was. What the heck are they? Great. A bit deeper, that's all. That's like um, Russet Burbank. Just a little bit deeper than the rest of the gardens. That's all. So i got to get in there with a pitchfork probably and have a real look around. Another potato garden here. Got some great onions out here. Look at this one. Looks like something ate the tops off of this. Probably just broken from the hurricane. Can't see a deer eating the top off an onion, but yeah, some nice, nice big onion. That's maybe a three, almost four incher. Nice one. Those all need to be picked and dried out. I just need a good sunny day. And my uh, coveted Georgia candy roaster squash. I'm guessing it's just about time to harvest these, given uh, the risk of frost. I'm just going to give them a few more days in the sun. To, you give them, you know, like the, basically the foliage dials back, and uh, you don't want them to get compromised by frost, but you want to get them a couple days of sun because it helps harden the skin up, which uh, helps them uh, keep, right? Almost like you're wrapping them in this uh, very special kind of wrapper that only squash can make use of. Anyway, that's where we are, middle of September 2019. Uh, one week after the hurricane, I really just left the garden as is. <laughs> I've been out here picking some things, but I haven't really done a lot of work to fix things other than the trees that had tipped over. Um, yeah, it could have been a lot worse, but uh, so I'm, I'm sort of grateful, I guess, that it wasn't as bad as it could have been. So yeah, still lots of things coming out of the garden, still a lot to do. 
um, this time of year I find I'm sort of reaching that almost like an exhaustion point right because your your garden's producing so much and you're trying to uh, cook with it as often as possible and also trying to store and put things down and because you don't want to see things go to waste like that garden over there with the uh, uh, Swiss chard all those yellow leaves that's because I didn't keep up with it right no, no leaves should be going yellow you should be picking them before they turn yellow and and putting either eating them or, or, or storing them away somehow freezing them blanching them um, so that's just me not not keeping up with things it's just the hurricane sort of upset my whole mojo here and you got to remember I got I work five days a week you know, I get a full-time job and a commute so uh, it doesn't take much to, to upset this secret sauce here if we get someone come and stay with us for a few days or you know a sort of a, no electricity for, for a few days or you know any sort of major upset to our life um, the garden's last on a list of priorities you know I've got a wife got kids I got a job and so uh, you know things just get put off <laughs> I'm sure everybody uh, understands exactly you know this, uh, I'm not achieving perfection here the goal is to uh, grow as much of my own food as I can with a little work as possible and uh, on any given day if I don't feel like coming out here I just don't bother <laughs> I want to go fishing or I want to go for a hike or what was it Friday night I went in the woods overnight just to just get away from it all and there was a thousand things I could have been doing around the house but I just wanted to get out and do that and uh, next weekend I think I gotta go do something with my kids so uh, that's more important right um, the great thing about having a no-till garden using the permaculture approach is that uh, your garden's there waiting for you when uh, you've got time for it it takes care of itself like a wild growing system so uh, it, it's completely accommodating for if, you, if you're kind of like me and there's just days where you don't feel like doing anything really nothing bad's going to happen so uh, anyway just a little bit of rambling there I hope uh, this video was interesting if it, uh, if it was interesting to you, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun with your garden. Thanks for watching.